The following is brought to you by Vertical Vet. Rethink your GPO. Hello, Vertical Vet family. I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Chief Veterinary Officer for Vertical Vet, and I want to thank you to welcome, welcome you to another edition of Business Academy. And today it is sponsored by our dear friends and partners at Boehringer Ingelheim. And we're going to have a very important conversation on this edition of the Business Academy, and that is about how do we talk about selling things to our clients? How do we talk about price increases with our staff? I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the inflation world. World or the economics of, of the world are really, you know, in question. And today we've got a very special guest that I can't wait to introduce you to. And she is none other than my friend and yours. She's been on here before. Kelly Cronin, an amazing veterinary technician. And just a little brief history about her. She went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, beautiful campus, where she got her BS in animal sciences. She then became licensed as a veterinary technician, starting out in Alaska, but she moved around to New Mexico and Wisconsin. And uh, then she became certified as a professional in human resources all the way back in 2010. And then she got her MBA from none other than Mississippi State University and became a vet tech specialist. And this is really where she's made a lot of impact, in my opinion, in our world in emergency and critical care back in 2013. I really, if you haven't read her book in the middle, I think it's really a, a recommended reading for any manager or veterinary technician who's aspiring to leadership positions. But that book uh, is really, I, I think for me, you captured a lot of, of the challenges that vet techs face as they get promoted up into more leadership positions. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for that book because, you know, Becky Mosser, my podcast uh, co-host over the years, we refer to it all the time. I think it's great. So again, welcome Kelly Cronin. Thank you so much. I really enjoy being on your show every single time. And uh, this is such an important topic. I'm very, very excited to talk about it. Yeah. And again, we want to thank our friends at Boeing Ingelheim for making this possible because, you know, they are also trying to help us as veterinary practices to survive this because, you know, Kelly, let's face it, every day in the news, we are overwhelmed with fears about, you know, inflation and supply chain logistics challenges. I mean, so this is, I think money is maybe at the forefront of a lot of, of veterinary practices minds. And so today we really want to kind of give them some reassurances that, hey, maybe increasing prices is okay, but more importantly, how to, I think, address the whole concept of, hey, we have to do this for a living, right? Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that we have to really look at is the fact that as we're seeing these cola increases, you know, we saw 2020, we saw it bump up 5.9%. In uh, 2023, we're projecting almost 9.6% we have to stay on top of that, but we also have to recognize that we've been a little bit behind times long-term in terms of our pricing structure versus some of the other, uh, you know, some of the other industries out there, really. Cool. When we look at our debt to salary ratios for veterinarians, we're so low compared to the other, um, you know, the other health fields. You're not joking. And again, even without going into student debt to income ratios, which I think is an entirely different topic, you know, let's just talk about what's happening in Main Street USA. I mean, we are seeing, I mean, historically, the dollar store, everything was a dollar or less. And now it's definitely not less than a dollar, at least not at my dollar stores. So we're seeing prices increase. We just saw a report recently that pet inflation is at staggering rates. In fact, pet food and pet care items went up this last month, which we're recording this uh, and in September of 2022, but for July period was 9.1%. So again, Kelly, talk to us a little bit about we're seeing prices increase all around us, but yet so many veterinary clinics are saying, whoa, I don't know if I can increase my fees, you know, and that, that takes a toll. And that's hard because when we look at what people actually put their onus on and what they, you know, what they really are thinking about spending, you know, Last year, we actually saw $34.3 billion spent on vet, uh, on vet care. We saw $29.8 billion spent on live animals and supplies. And we saw $500 million spent on Halloween costumes. So really, we have to look at not... We have to look more at what people are willing to spend and where they put their dollar and actually making a big impact on how they spend their veterinary dollar as opposed to really thinking, gosh, we are putting such a strain on our on our clients because when we look at that, you know, we just saw Linda spend more spending Jaja, this land shark of a, a chihuahua. 
uh, and then torturing her by putting a, a Halloween costume on it, then we've seen her spend on Zsa Zsa's healthcare. And so I think that if we really concentrate on gold standard medicine and really concentrate on changing the client perception as to where that money should be spent, we can do a really big change in terms of making those clients understand and see the value that we provide um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think that is one thing that veterinarians need to be reminded of over and over and over again is the fact that they are spending a lot of money on their pets outside of the vet clinic. And in many cases, in fact, the majority of cases, like you mentioned, they're spending more right on, on frivolous things. And again, I don't want to get judgmental because it's their money. They can do what they want. But at the same time, we can't say, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm fearful of raising my fecal exam by two dollars when on the other hand, they're going out and spending, you know, one hundred and twenty dollars on pet food and treats, you know, in one drop. So sure. I, I really appreciate you bring that. So so let's do dig that into that just a little bit further, Kelly. And so now you're a veterinary technician, you're a manager, you're an owner out there. And you're going, that sounds great. And I understand I'm getting squeezed at Starbucks, but I still don't feel comfortable doing that ethically, morally to my clients. How do you help assuage some of those concerns? I think the biggest thing is that we have to be really cognizant of not putting our finances on our clients. I don't know how many times I've had a conversation with a vet where, you know, they're really looking at what that client should or could spend on a veterinary treatment. And the reality is, is that that's not our choice. It's not our biggest, um, you know, our biggest thing that we need to do walking into that exam room is present the choices that are appropriate for the client and present things at the cost line that really makes sense for our practice. So thinking in terms of what these things really do cost us um, and we can really do a good job of trying to make sure that, you know, we capture all those costs. We can even go so far as to look at how much a day costs us for us to be open or how much an hour costs us to be open in order to make sure that when we're looking at prices and when we're looking at those things that take so much time, like the, uh, you know, 25 minute fractious animal nail trim, that we're making sure to capture those costs and those, um, you know, those real time uh, items that that takes so much of our day. And that is something that we can really do a good job of just matching those things up for our staff as well by being a little bit more open about our finances with our team. Yeah. And, and I love that you mentioned that, Kelly, because, you know, we often compare ourselves to human medicine and we then say, well, it costs a lot of money to do all that stuff. And a real world example, Vertical Vet Family, my daughter had an injury recently, had to go through four physical therapy sessions, $900, right? And, and I'll be honest with you, my wife questioned them. So, you know, and insurance paid for part of that. So obviously, you know, luckily we didn't have to pay for all of that. But the reality is she said, I'm, you know, this is expensive for physical therapy. These are like, you know, 45 minute sessions or whatever. Whatever. And literally the person without blinking was like, well, you know, I have a PhD in physical therapy or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, and this is what it costs for us to run our facility w without hesitation, you know, just complete solid confidence in that. So maybe give us some advice that we can take from an example like that. Or as you say, you know, comparing gold standard medicine of humans. And while we don't blink an eye in many instances, you know, or, or even if we complain, we still accept it. So how can we apply that type of, I guess, mental strategy, strategy or coping? mechanism to our fees? I think one of the biggest things is that we have to really think in terms of how do we create a whole team who believes in gold standard medicine. And I, I do believe that there is something to be said for starting at the very get-go. And that means interviewing for people who believe in gold standard medicine, potentially asking them what their experience in medicine for their own personal pets are. Because frankly, if we really look at people who are already doing what we're asking our clients to do, isn't it so much easier for them to say, hey, this is what I would do in, in my situation, or this is completely, um, you know, this is completely within reason for your pet because they find it completely within reason for their pet. So that's one of the things that I really look for is, hey, I'm going to try and find team members who believe in the standard of medicine that is, you know, appropriate for what our pets actually need and being really open with our staff as to what those cost structures really look like. I can tell you that there are so many times that you walk onto a shift and those clients know, um, you know, know that it costs to run a medical facility because they're trained by human medicine, 
but the team doesn't know that, hey, it costs you almost $300 just to turn the lights on in the morning. You know, it, it's very much one of those situations where knowledge is power. And the more that we can share with our teams so that they have the knowledge of what things actually cost. And, you know, they see a three times markup on something and they don't recognize that, hey, that three times markup is because of the fact that there's 0.4 times that markup is just the merchant fees. You know, that's just so that we can run the credit card in order to pay for that medication. Or, you know, there's a certain amount that's associated with that that team member who spent 25 minutes looking up that medication and talking about that medication and two years learning about that medication in order to give that client the gold standard care and all the knowledge that they need in order to utilize that medication. There's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, I, I can't say enough good things about what you just said. And, and Kelly, you know me. I mean, this is something we have touted to veterinarians and owners for, you know, for 30, 30 years in my case. And, you know, we used to say, Kelly, back in the day, I used to really put this exercise on owners and managers to say, do you know how much it costs you per day just in staffing? And most yep. managers out there cannot answer that question. And I'll tell you, that is where you begin to build this foundation of understanding what it costs to run this place. And that, again, is a cultural shift for many veterinarians, right? I mean, so, so I think that there was this period of time, especially like when baby boomers were running everything. Uh, no offense, but hey, Gen X, we're here. So we've been here for a while. And now we're getting overshadowed quickly by millennials. But the reality is, you know, they were saying, well, we keep all the finances secret, right? We don't talk about anything. And then my generation comes along. We're like, whoa, we need a little more open book here because people want transparency. They want to trust why we're doing this markup or whatever, because otherwise they say, wow, what a ripoff. So we started opening the books and explaining to our team, wow, this is what it costs to do what we we do. And I think that shift is continuing to progress. So let's let's talk to that clinic out there today that maybe still hasn't bought into at least semi open book types of, of management philosophy. But how would you nudge them into that direction of saying, OK, you've got to build a culture like we've just said that supports and is confident in our fees. How, how would you nudge them in that direction? I think the biggest nudge is that we have so many teams that are very, very share, uh, scared to share their information out to their team. They say, gosh, these these team members are going to see how much we're making and they're going to just get frustrated. And why don't I make more? And I think that the biggest nudge that I want to give you is that if you explain the correct, you know, if you explain the correct kind of ratio of the things that you need in order to get the profit margin that you want to get, and if you explain that in veterinary medicine, our profit margin is not outrageous, it is just, you know, on the cusp of where we really should be compared to things like McDonald's at a 22% profit margin, or, um, you know, in compared to attorneys who have a 25% profit margin, we have capacity to do a little bit better in terms of the profit margin. And if we explain that that's where we need to be, because let's face it, things like remodels and mortgages come out of those profit margins, we can really do a good job of talking to those team members and really under, helping them understand where those numbers come into play and how they can actually affect those numbers by driving revenue and things like that. And I think there's so many veterinary clinics out there right now that are doing such a good job of saying, gosh, if we hit a certain point in either our profit margin or in our overall expense control, we're going to share with, with you some of that income. And I think that that's where we can really bring that knowledge to our teams, potentially leverage that knowledge, potentially leverage, you know, what those, those clinics are willing to do in terms of rewarding our team members for running a tight ship and making sure that they're doing charge capture and making sure that they're doing gold standard medicine so that clients, you know, so that clients get what is appropriate for their pets. Yeah, and I love that. And again, profit sharing, so many tax advantages. I mean, you know, if you've heard me or others lecture over the past 25 years, we're like, why not? This makes no sense, guys. Come on. So again, that's another topic. But Kelly, it's so good to hear, you know, again, us continue to reinforce these messages. But let's also talk about what's happening in the job market and, and also from a demand standpoint of pet parents for our services. So how is that influencing prices? Because I mean, right now, let's face it, guys, A, we can't get enough people to work in our clinics, just a, an issue, really not just in veterinary medicine, but across the board. But B, we're seeing increased demand for our services, whether it's due to new pet parents during the pandemic, or just a greater awareness of what we can do doesn't matter we're seeing those two issues sort of now intersect and cause a real problem but but kelly you see it as a potential you know win for everybody and, and maybe an opportunity 
I do. I do. I think long, you know, as, as long as I've been in veterinary medicine, we've had conversations about how can we have these, you know, these veterinary technicians who've gone to school for two years, who come out with the same amount of debt in some cases as some of our human counterparts, but make a fraction thereof. And I think that honestly, the same thing goes for our veterinarians. You know, they, they come out with sometimes more debt than some of our human counterparts, and yet you know, make a fraction thereof. And so what I love to see is the fact that we are seeing an increase in the overall wage market. And guys, if you haven't updated your wage brackets, you know, go and do that because you never want to see a point where you're bringing on team members that potentially are not as trained or situated for your location as, um, you know, those who are already in, in place you never want to bring them on for something more than the rest of your team is really making. So what we look at is we look at the fact that we've seen a 7% overall increase in our wage prices in veterinary medicine for the past year. We really want to think about, gosh, that's a great thing for veterinary medicine. This is not a terrible thing. This is a great thing. But we have to make sure that our prices compensate. And when we look at that 7% showing up on our profit and loss statement in our employment line, we also have to look at the fact that we have to preserve our labor margin. So when we see that 7%, we need to see that come down to our bottom line um, and, and effectively take it times whatever we want it to be in order to preserve that profit margin. So it's not just that 7% pass through that needs to show up on our pricing is really the amount that we need to get to in order to make sure that that 7% doesn't erode our, our um, profit margin. Right. And you know, Kelly, a couple of key points I want to just point out with this. This takes a lot of effort. Like you as a manager, as an owner, have got to be paying attention to your financials. And I think that too often vets just want to set it and forget it. And it just doesn't work that way. I mean, this is why getting back to that example of how much does it cost you for your human, re- your, your staff today, right? I mean, can you tell me that number? Because that is a real number that you have to pay. And so paying attention to financials actually allows you to do this. You know, in all of our clinics, what we always did, we accomplished was we had a 25% margin profit margin. That was our goal. And we hit it. Why? Because we were attentive to it. We were constantly working on it. And we made adjustments here and there on the fly based on demand and staffing and, and resources, just all those things. And you know, Kelly, I, I one of the things that does frustrate me a little bit is the independent practitioner, the mindset has always been, I don't have time to do this. Now we fast forward to an era of corporate medicine, and they have all the time to do that, you know, and so they're showing us. So if you're an independent practitioner, which is, again, who we are here to help at Vertical Vet, I want you to take these lessons seriously. I mean, we're now in an era, I believe, Kelly, when you can't afford to ignore it anymore. And it's just not going to happen passively, right? I mean, I think I get frustrated with vets just saying, well, I don't know why I can't hit this number. And it's like, you're not really trying. What What are some things they can do to try other than what I've outlaid? I mean, I think the biggest thing that we have to do is really think about, gosh, how do we make sure that we've got that charge capture? Because honestly, as an independent practitioner, you know, it really is a huge hit to your bottom line if you're giving away the store. And we have to really think about, you know, when we're driving that value and that perception of good value, you know, if we don't show those clients and if we don't utilize those discounts that potentially that veterinarian is using for you know, for the most impact that you possibly can have with that client, you're really not doing it right, right? If you're just throwing a discount on there because you potentially feel like that that client can't pay or shouldn't pay, or you just feel like the bill is too high, you know, you set those prices for a reason, set them in reality, you know, really look at how much those things actually cost for you and what you need that profit margin to be from that individual item, and then keep with it. And if you give any kind of discount, make sure that it shows up on the bill that you've given the discount, make sure that it drives additional service, make sure that it drives client loyalty or that it drives a new visit. Because honestly, if it doesn't, you've given that discount for no good reason. Yeah. And this is why I I have written innumerable articles over the years, guys, talking about the dangers of discounting for that very reason. I remember one of my early articles in veterinary economics back in the day, I just did a simple showed showed, showed the math behind it and said, hey, guys, you know, this is actually this 10 percent is probably costing you 40 percent in profit and so forth. And again, it depends on your practice dynamics. I don't want to get into that argument today, but it's impactful. But you did mention a couple of things I want to come back to, and that is about value, you know, and again, how we value our services and the public values. And that comes into this 
this equation. And the first thing I want to ask you about, because is is our own perception, right? We've talked about this multiple times here, but I believe that this lack of confidence in our services, again, we don't perceive what we're doing as valuable, aka, then we don't want to charge for it. We give discounts. Tell me how can that veterinary technician, manager or owner watching today sort of start to reconcile that and say it is worth it. I mean, we've talked around this. We've talked about comparisons to human medicine. We've said dollar store and McDonald's are going up in price. But yet that person's still sitting there going, I'm just not comfortable with that. Help them out. I think the biggest thing is that I would really love if you feel like your prices are are too much. I would really love for you to look at your team members and say, gosh, you know, compared to someone else who's potentially doing this in a different field, right? Someone who's maybe, um, you know, maybe working at a retail store and, and think in terms of what that person would be doing. Think about how much more knowledge, think about how much more care, think about that, you know, potentially that veterinary technician who, you know, after a anesthetic procedure is hanging out in a cage with that pet or think about you know the fact that you see a group of veterinary technicians gather around a table talking about a case to really understand that case more or think about the fact that you have veterinarians who are writing their records because they want those records to be so perfect you know four or five hours after their shift and then also think about the fact that we right now are in a, a high time you know we have hour long waits at a lot of our emergency clinics hour upon hour long waits. And so if we don't ride this wave and if we don't take advantage of the idea that we can bring up our prices to where they really should be, not where they, you know, not where they're inflated. This is just us getting to the point of where our prices really should be and where our clients should be trained to expect veterinary prices in order to allow for a healthy profit margin. You know, we can really think about the fact that at this moment we are at a point where we're at just a position where we can bring up our prices to what it, you know, to what it really should have been for the last long bit. And we can do that with our wages as well. We're seeing that wage bump overall in veterinary medicine, but we can really see specific wage bumps in our own practices. And we can justify it with price increases that we're seeing across all of the other industries. Yeah, and, and guys, more you, a dollar Big Mac than it ever did before. Right, right. I mean, you've heard this for decades, and and now we've really reached a confluence of economic factors that force us to do it. And again, I like what you said. This isn't about inflating just for price inflation's sake. This is actually trying to reset to fair and reasonable. And I just don't right. think it's ever been fair and reasonable. And I do think that that leads us to the last part of this little discussion around value and perceptions, because so long we have undercharged and underpaid our staff, we're now seeing friction. We're seeing a lot of tension and complaints, right? Because let's two things. Number one, our staff has had it. They said, you know, we've seen, I've been paid so little for so long, I'm not taking any more. And they're either leaving, they're changing jobs, whatever, right? And on the same hand, we're seeing clients who said, I've paid so little for so long, suddenly now you're raising it up to the fair price. I don't like that either. Help us with those two dilemmas. Well, I think one of the biggest things that we really have to do is, again, that education piece, right? Like clients don't see our medicine. They're not in our treatment areas watching us do the things that that make us the money. So we have to really educate them as to what that looks like. Educate the clients as to what goes into these services. Educate the clients as to, you know, where we sit in terms of overall profit margin. I don't think that we tell clients that we don't make as much as some of these other industries. And I think that honestly, that's an open and honest conversation that we can have with them. And I think the other thing, the other part of that is that when we're doing any kind of price increases, we can really tell our team why that's happening and give them real world examples as to what that looks like and bring them in on making those changes so that they're part of the process. You know, they're going to fall in line and really agree with our, our price increases a lot more if we make them aware of why they're happening and if we bring them into that conversation. Yeah. And again, this is cultural, guys. And and we're seeing this shift. And it's kind of remarkable to me, too. I'm actually seeing, I hate to say this, but some of the corporate practices doing a better job of this than some of the independents. They're actually, they're instilling a sense of pride in the entire team, you know, and, and that 
is just the art of leadership, right? I mean, it's plain and simple. There's nothing magical about it. But so again, you know, Kelly, just as, as we wrap up this conversation, because I want to get to this amazing, interesting quote that you want to share with our, our viewers today. But let's talk a little bit about that. How, how can we like, okay, we've said we need to do it. And we've both given little hints and tips. But what does that really look like? I mean, do you have a staff training meeting? Do you post things on a board somewhere? I mean, what, what does it look like when we're talking about trying to share with them how much it costs and why this is important? I do think that it's really tough to do in a total meeting. Now, there are times where you can say, gosh, these are the, you know, these are the reasons that we need to think about doing this in a total meeting in a in a large staff meeting. But I think that it really is a situation where the more that we can pull individuals to really give them a little bit of a back end look as to, you know, this is how much this actually costs you. Maybe in that full team meeting, you know, you're showing them an hour of your time and what that breaks down to, you know, the utilities associated with the the rent associated associated with it, the cost of the facility, the cost of the items, or maybe it's a, in a full team meeting, you know, you're taking apart one, one pricing item where you're looking at, Hey, this actually takes two technicians, you know, 20 minutes. That's, uh, you know, for our average staff member, that's $30. This, um, also goes into it and this is this much. And, and so we have to price it at this way in order to get to where we need to, in terms of overall take home margin. But I think it really is impactful to do it a little bit more on a one-on-one -on -one basis where we're really working with an individual team member or a group of smaller, um, a smaller group of individual team members to really give them the background information as to what you're doing and how you're thinking about it and potentially pulling them into setting some of those prices that are not quite so cut and dry, right? Like the the things that are a little bit more value-based as opposed to cost-driven and potentially having their input and their buy-in and, and really explaining to them that these two things are so interconnected and so, um, so much of an opportunity right now that we can really gather and kind of grow where we need to. Yeah, it's these are conversations we need to be having. And that leads us to the last thing you wanted to point out today to the Vertical Vet family. And that's a quote that you wanted to share and discuss. And I definitely want to get your, you know, your take on this for sure. So the quote says, uh, a wise veterinarian once said, when clients take my time to complain about prices, it's time to raise them to give more attention to clients who clearly value my service. Now you wanted to share that with the, the viewer. So explain to us why that's important to you and, and what does it really mean? I think that it really means that we are absolutely going to have naysayers. We're going to have folks who potentially don't want to pay for the higher end services. And I think that what we really have to think about as veterinary providers is, do we want to be that veterinary provider who caters to the, the folks who want the lowest common denominator? And I, I vote no, because frankly, when I do veterinary medicine, you know, part of what drove me to this, this industry and part of what keeps me here is the fact that there are clients out there that just absolutely love their pets. And in this high time where we're seeing so much demand, where we're seeing so much wait time, you know, we can really cater, you know, because we can't serve everyone. We just can't. And it's, it's a take home message that, we all feel like we want to serve everyone. And I think that's part of the big things that are weighing down on our industry today is we feel like we're letting people down because we can't take care of everyone. But the reality is, is that no one can take care of everyone. That's why there's multiple veterinary clinics. And, and honestly, if we're going to be that gold standard care provider, and if we're going to take care of folks, why not take care of them and their pets, you know, to the top of our ability? And why not you know, really work with the team members that want to provide that, work with the clients who want to provide that to their pets, as opposed to, you know, really stretching ourselves for people who clearly, you know, who clearly don't appreciate it as much. Why don't we handpick our clients in the way that we really need to in order to give our staff that good uh, quality experience with clients who really care? 
Yeah, and I, and I can't reinforce this enough. I, I know one of my favorite lectures, and I still drag it out every now and then, is back from the mid-2000s. And we were actually in an economic downturn at that time. And what I was showing people was how we did a, um, an, a revenue analysis of our clients. And so we wanted to figure out who was spending what, right? And, and back then, yeah. Pareto principle was really starting to pop and the 80-20 rule, right? And so what I actually found after looking at years of financial data on my clinic was that about 30% of the clients were driving, you know, Know, that 80 percent so it wasn't perfect Pareto but it was pretty darn close and so what we realized was wow there's a whole lot of people that show up once every year or two and they are usually the loudest complainers <laughs> you know so I, I I can't emphasize enough how important what Kelly just said is and the fact is that you really do need to find out who is your client base and who are actually who's paying the bills and then you really want to cater to their needs and again Kelly, this goes back to paying attention, doing the financials. Like if we we started that exercise in 1996 of actually drilling in, and and for a long time there, we had a list in our front off in our lobby area of the top 100 clinics for the prior year or clients for the prior year, and that meant that it, when they showed up, I wanted my starting with the CSRs all the way back to the doctors to say, oh wow, okay, you're like a VIP. Why? Because those people were paying their salary. I don't know if you've ever tried any tricks like that, but you know, they do work. Well, and I do think that there is something to be said for the fact that we need to really give a lot of attention and care to every single person who walks in our door, but we don't have to stretch ourselves for the folks who are, you know, really fighting us on what we should be doing because we know what good quality medicine is. We know that that, that, that heartworm pill is actually going to do something. My, my Costa Rican cur that I got off a beach had heartworm. And I'll tell you straight up, it made me a huge believer in heartworm prevention, right? And so when we think about things like that, you know, if we have to fight to the finish to get a client to do what we decide is, uh, you know, gold standard for that pet because we have years of experience and knowledge to draw from, you know, do we really want to try and coerce someone into doing what's right for their pet? Or do we want to take the la path of least resistance, which is right now seeing the clients that are actually choosing to do their own good quality care that are seeking us out and that are really, you know, stretching themselves in order to do the right thing. Um, I, you know, I really aim to the latter just because of the fact that when, you know, when my team goes into a room and gets beat down because that client is just not doing the right thing for their pet and, you know, they're in it because they want that pet to feel good, you know, I don't really want that to be a day in, day out for my team. I really want my team to be able to go into that room and say, hey, here's what is going to fix your pet or as close to it as we can possibly get. You know, it's going to cost you this much, but it's going to be best for your pet. And potentially that a conversation ends there and all of a sudden they're off and able to do what's right for that pet. And yeah. so that's the that's the ideal, right? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I play to the raving fans and the people that are going to always be critical and take advantage of the emotional state of my team. I'm going to be like, hey, you know, I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm also, like you said, not going to stretch for you, you know. So I do think there's yeah. tremendous value in knowing who your clients are. Well, Kelly Cronin, I got to tell you, I really have enjoyed this conversation. Uh, again, you can check her out at vettechlife.com. And if you haven't gone there, you should because she's always posting amazing stuff on her Facebook page as well. So Kelly, again, thank you so much for sharing some of your experiences and expertise with the Vertical Vet family. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Well, guys, I got to tell you, I am so happy to bring to you these kind of discussions on the Business Academy. I want to thank our sponsors, Boeinger Ingelheim, for bringing us Kelly Cronin. I mean, she is one of those veterinary technicians that's making a positive difference in the world, and you know how much that means to all of us. So if you have questions about this, if you'd like to learn more, definitely check us out, call us, whatever. If you're a member of Vertical Vet, this is the kind of stuff we do for you on a daily. So if you just ring us up, we're going to help you manage some of these price increases, give you some benchmarks, help you out any way possible. If you're not a vertical vet member yet uh why not <laughs> it doesn't cost anything you can definitely call us up and figure out all the wonderful things we do we do everything from virtual practice management services to win backs for clients that maybe have lapsed in their care to just helping you manage your business on the daily so again on behalf of the entire amazing team at vertical vet and thank you again boringor for for sponsoring this i am chief veterinary officer dr ernie ward it has been my pleasure you guys have a great day bye